Good day, Stella. First of all, oh. let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Thanks for having me, Guy. Good day to you, too. Oh, thank you. Um, we're going to go through a four-part introduction of you through a series of questions that I have here. Um, yeah. But could we start with you introducing yourself and, share, and telling us your name? Sure. I didn't realize it's four parts, so I only have one part response. Um, my name is Stella Lee. I'm based in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And tell us, where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in Hong Kong, actually. Um, but I have since uh, lived in five different countries and about 20 cities around the world. Wow, that's impressive. So let's uh, jump ahead to when you went off to university. Where yeah. did you go and what did you study? Well, I started out as an artist. So I um, it's always my first love. Um, but I'm always, always curious and interested in the interaction of or the intersection of design, uh, art, education, and technology. And um, so I started out actually in Pennsylvania in the US. So I went to universities in, in the States. Um, I did my first degree in a uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts and also my master's in communications also in the US. And I ended up getting my PhD in computer science in the UK. Ah, very interesting. And I did notice uh, just recently, didn't you post yeah. something about you've moved or started a site with a lot of your artwork on it? Yes, I have. Um, it's just my, um, it's my attempt and kind of motivation for me to get back into it. Um, as you know, um, you know, your work, it's just all consuming and I'm, I want to have a little bit of balance uh, to nurture my creative side. And normally I like to do big scale, like, like mural, like size paintings, but um, that takes up time. So I, I also like uh, doing small scale sketches, especially um, like urban sketches of, of architectures or, or people portraits. So that's kind of my attempt to uh, balance my life a little bit and kind of get back to the creative side. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, you'll have to share the URL with me and I'll put that sure. in the YouTube show notes here for our guests. Um, so after you uh, graduated and got your uh, doctorate yeah. in computer science, where, where did you go to work? Let's start your career progression and your jobs to, to up until today. But where did you go sure. to college? Yeah, so I took a break between my master's and my um, PhD. So I actually started my career in North Carolina. So um, without knowing anything about the state, I moved to Greensboro, North Carolina, and started my first, um, first job at Bennett College, um, African-American College for Women. And um, very interestingly, my, my first project actually, so I was the, the webmaster for the college back in the days when internet was all the rage, and it was kind of like the beginning of, of e-learning, kind of you know, creeping into academic world uh, where everybody trying to figure out how to move things online, how do you incorporate technologies into classroom teaching and learning. Um, interestingly, my first project there, um, they were like, oh, you know, we have this, um, this tape um, of, of Martin Luther King that gave a talk at our college. Could you digitize it so we can use it for teaching and in, in, in the classroom? So that was my first, first project that I started here. Oh, very interesting. Yes. <laughs> so so uh, what, what, where did you go after Bennett? I, I went to Duke. So, so North Carolina always have a special place in my heart. Um, I started, so I moved to Duke University in Durham and uh, at the Center for Instructional Technology, helping faculty um, and staff to figure out how to make use of um, instructional tech. And um, after that, I moved to England doing very similar things. Um, also figuring out how to move learning online um, for the university, um, this time um, partner with the home office and in the UK, so. Ah, and then uh, where'd you go from there? Um, then I moved back to the side of the pond. Um, I ended up at Athabasca University in Edmonton. So I thought, okay, I worked at 
smaller colleges. I worked at more bigger traditional universities. So it's time for me to um, try a university that's 100% online and from a distance. So that's what kind of got me back to the side of the world. And um, so I also had to figure out how to uh, support the university to um, move from a more print-based distance learning model to um, an online, a fully online model. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what are you doing right now today? Um, so after that, I decided, um, so then I got my PhD kind in between. And after that, I thought, you know, I've been in the ivory tower for too long. I was curious about, well, what does, you know, learning and um, development and, you know, digital technology, how does it, how does it play out in the real world? Um, so I, I moved into the corporate world. And this is where I start realizing, okay, hang on a minute. There's more than just learning as, as the end goal, right? At, at universities, at, at, at schools, learning is, is the end goal. Not that I necessarily agree. Um, I think there's a little bit of an accountability piece that we need to think about now. Um, how are we preparing people for the, work for, for the workforce, right, after that? But it's, it's not, at least back when I was work, working at university, it's not that conversation. Like, it's, it's not part of the conversation. But in, at workplace learning, learning is a mean to an end. Um, it, ultimately, we want to make sure that people can perform, people can do their jobs. Um, so, so that's when I had my aha moment, if you will, and say, okay, so that's how workplace learning is different. Uh, the names are different as well, right? Um, and, and that's when I start learning, okay, what about the, the performance piece? Uh, how do we make that connection from, from learning to performance and how can we be accountable, not just, you know, he's, he's, your, he's your course, he's your session in a classroom and off you go. Um, there's that continuum, there's that iteration process as well. Um, so after a couple of years of that, I decided that I'm going to do my own thing. So I've been, um, so I started my company called Paradox Learning. Uh, it's, it's my eighth year now um, doing consulting work in this, in this space. Very, very interesting. Very cool. So that was a nice segue into <laughs> the next question, which is, the, the name of the series is Human Performance Technology Video. Yep. And, and the goal is to share the diversity of the practitioners and their practices in this space. So people that practice human performance technology, where, where the term technology refers to the application of science and not digital or computer technology per se. But but so it's it's that whole notion of how do we get people to perform better? How do we look at the entire performance context and all that? So some people call it human performance technology. Uh, others call it human performance improvement. Others evidence-based practices for something along the lines of performance perf uh, improvement. But how do you refer to it? And what, what was your first exposure to this uh, this world, this specific uh, set of disciplines? Yeah, you know, it's, 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 to me, I haven't even like, up to this point that I'm talking with you, I haven't even had a moment to kind of reflect back and say, okay, you know, these terms are changing all the time. Like to me, it's still like training and job base, you know, <laughs> or, or training menus and, and, classroom facilitations like so we we come a long way in in terms of even um changing terminologies and definition i like to look at it in a more holistic way i love the term um performance technology or performance support i also love looking at it from a, a learning experience perspective so to me it's, it's more just um is not like, okay, you take a, a course and that's the end of that. It's, it's looking at the entire, um, the learner's experience, but also the, the context that they're in. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I felt like I fail you there in giving you a definitive term. <laughs> it's like a paragraph of definition. That's okay. There's a lot of people who would say to me in these videos, I, guy, I don't use that term. I don't use it. <laughs> 
Uh, I, it's the last thing I would ever mention to a client, uh, but that's okay. So, so I think I think there's terms that we talk among ourselves as practitioners, right? Yeah. I think I, I think we talk about evidence based practices. We talk about performance based technologies, and we understand it. But um, yeah, but to clients, I think um, I think they still think about it as training. But the difference is how am I going to kind of like that's my way in, right? We talk, we meet them where they're at, they understand training, but then you kind of watch that door a little bit and like, well, did you know training also means these other things? Um, so to me, it's like using this kind of the same term they understand, but widening the definition. Yes. So <laughs> for some of your earliest influences, so uh, yeah. maybe we'll get to more recent influences that yeah. you might point our audience to, but but who from your earliest exposure to this, this world um, yeah. were influential to you, the people or books or articles uh, that might come to mind? So um, because of my background in design and in computer science, um, and as I mentioned, I am big on learning experiences and learning experiences. So my early, early influences, it really came from, human computer interaction or HCI. Um, and within that there's UX, right? User experience or uh, user-centered design methodology. So people within that tradition, um, Donald Norman, design of everyday things is a classic to me. And also emotional design by the same guy. Um, also really like um, the whole field in information architecture. It came from more of a library science. How do you organize and mix sense of information? Um, information architecture by Christine Christina Wolke. Um, it's one of my earlier books that I really like. Wow, there's a, there's a reason information, it's easier to understand. And there's a reason that certain information is really difficult to understand, right? Uh, the Elements of User, of, of user Experience, another book by uh, Jesse James Garrett, a uh, lovely guy. I met I met these people as well, um, admired their work. Um, and what I like about it is um, they quite cross-discipline focus. So they're looking at it from, um, and I still think it applies to, to learning and performance support as well. Um, and other discipline I really like, and I think it has huge application for us is behavioral economics. Um, so, uh, Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, I, when, I, when I met him at, at a conference, I, I felt starstruck. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I, was, I was so geeky. I was like, oh, can you sign my book, please? You know, <laughs> um, uh, Nudge, Richard Thaler, um, also very, very good and influential. Um, Scarcity by Sun Hill. Oh my God, I'm going to butcher his name. Mulan Nathan, <laughs> Mulan Nathan. Um, scarcity is the name of the book. Um, and also, I think um, there's also a little bit of like uh, with behavioral, behavioral economics, there's also a bit of the neuroscience, right, of, of, um, of understanding about how we, how we think. Um, so your brain at work, uh, David Rock, um, really interesting to me. Uh, brain rules, uh, John Medina also. So, um, so yeah, those are kind of like the, the bigger... Um, pockets of um, disciplines that I'm really interested in kind of outside your more traditional education and, and L&D um, mm -hmm. area. Well, thank you. Let me shift gears here for yeah. a moment and ask you, uh, as so we could provide an example to others, yeah. but, it, but if you were at a garden party and somebody asked you, Stella, what do you <laughs> do what is your 30 second elevator speech describing you know, what it is that you do? Oh boy. You know, um, I, I don't think even I can pitch it to my parents. So, <laughs> um, what I, what I normally say is, um, I help people or organizations to, um, to understand and also to, leveraged or make better use of, of technology in supporting how people learn and how people work. Um, so my, my kind of lifelong goal really is um, how can I help people to, 
to optimize their potentials, right? How, how, and, and, and supporting that with the technology. Um, and I'm also very mindful of what the limitations of technologies are. And so on the flip side of that, I'm always um, bringing awareness to say, okay, it's, it's, it's one way of, of doing things. It's, um, it, it opened up some doors, but it's not, it's not beyond and all. So I think part of that is educating people uh, to be aware, to be mindful of also the limitations of technology in supporting learning and performance as well. Mm -hmm. So true. And I really like your comment. You can't explain it or you wouldn't explain it to your parents. It's a it's a age <laughs> joke that I heard when I got in the business. I didn't understand it for a few years, but when my own relatives questioned me on yeah. what exactly is it that you do, because they can't imagine that we could teach others how to do their job when we never did yeah. it ourselves. It's it's uh, it's just amazing to them. But I think I think my mom thinks I teach computers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, yeah, it's easier to give people that kind of an answer and let them believe what they want to believe rather than try to take them on on a, some journey where you explain it. What well, it except, especially when you say, "Oh, you'd be in a garden party," and I mentioned I'm, in, you know, I'm trained as a computer scientist. I work in technology fields. Normally, people's reaction would be, "Oh, can you fix my printer?" You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's here. It's not working. But like. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, let me shift gears here again. Uh, as a lifelong learner, is there any particular focus that you have for your current learning? What can you share with that with us and tell us you're perhaps writing about it or, or, or yeah. uh, learning out loud? Yeah, um, yeah, many, many things. Um, <laughs> um, I think it's just what I mentioned about the limitation of technologies. And I've been thinking so much about that. Um, I don't know if you read anything by Neil Postman, um, communications professor, Ohio, I think it's Ohio State, University of Ohio. He wrote um, quite critically, um, he had since passed away um, in the 2000s, but he wrote quite critically about the role of technology in society. And it's, it's always been in the back of my mind, but I think um, lately uh, with newer tech, like, machine learning and artificial intelligence, I think these issues are more pressing in terms of um, are there biases that built in that we don't know or can't detect? Are there ethical is issues? Um, are, are they impacting um, privacy and, and security, right, of, of everyday life? Um, so I've been reading up so much in that area just to like, for me first, I need to understand it. Um, and then I want to share that learning with other people and say, hey, um, did you need to, you know, when you're purchasing a piece of tech, say for um, performance support for, um, for maybe um, recruitment purposes, hiring candidates, um, did you know this, there might be biases built in? Like, are you aware of that? Um, did you know how to check for that, right? Um, so, so I'm fascinated and also quite concerned about these ethical issues. So I'm reading up more and more as each new piece of tech introduce, uh, you know, more gray areas. So, mm -hmm. so that's where my focus is. I've been writing a lot about that. Um, and, and I think in the, and to step back, it's not just ethical and privacy, but just uh, in general, um, trying to understand like when, when it's, when there's a reason to use a piece of tech or when there's a reason not to use it, um, what are the limitations? Um, you know, what's, when, what are the opportunity costs uh, when you're using, uh, when you make decision to use that, right? Um, as opposed to, is it better to allocate your resources elsewhere? So that's kind of where I'm at right now. <laughs> is, is, so are these part of your consulting services that your firm offers? Absolutely. Yeah. I always do that anyway. I think everything I do, I always try to put that in there, even though people don't outright ask me to do it. I always say, hey, um, I know you asked me to look at the technological, you know, capability, but along with that, here are the considerations. 
So what other services, tell us a little bit about your firm and, and what yeah. it, uh, what services you render to your clients and, and who are not by name your clients, but what industries and such do you serve? Yeah, um, a lot of public sectors and government um, organizations, but um, I also work with NGOs um, and private sectors. Um, I can I can name them. Like my current project is with the Asian Development Bank. So like they are like the World Bank for Asia. And we're working on a project on ed tech evaluation. So basically um, our target audience are the country ministry of education in Asia to help them understand um, not just what are the potentials of ed tech. Um, I think COVID really kind of help us, um, you know, or help, help people understand like the potentials. I think we don't have to explain why we need that now. I think it's more the conversation has shifted to what and how to use it. Um, so we, um, we're creating an evaluation framework um, to help people to understand and evaluate ed tech properly. Um, so that's one of the current project. And I do that um, with other clients as well. Um, a lot of companies ask, come and say, oh, um, we need a piece of um, learning tech, performance tech. Um, we don't know where to start. Or IT told us we need it, um, but how do we influence it from a learning and performance support perspective and not just from a technological perspective? So I kind of help them unpack that. I help them to identify who are the stakeholders in the organization that they need to get involved. Uh, I help them understand the process because you know if you're dropping that kind of money, you don't want to just like randomly pick one, right? Um, so to under help them understand the impact, help them um, figure out implementation strategy, but also help them um, evaluate for success once post implementation, how do you know if it's any good, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I come at it sometimes at different stages of, of that journey, but uh, but sometimes I do I, I stay on from start to finish as well. So, well, thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, I hope that anybody in our audience is looking for that kind of support will consider you and find you, and we will put your uh, various links, uh, URLs into the show notes and into the blog post that I will use to introduce this video in the next day or two. Thank you. I'm always happy to have conversation with people. Anyway, I think you know, fundamentally I'm an educator. So anybody that want to learn more about it, I'm really happy to share that information. So, yeah. And, oh, and to me, I think the more people are educated in, in these issues collectively, we, we're better off. So. Certainly. Certainly. Yeah. Well, let me shift gears here a little bit. Uh, my next question is about the language. And you've kind of alluded earlier to the fact that uh, so many of our terms and our, our language cha has changed over the years. Yeah. So my question is an opportunity for my guests to talk a little bit about that. And is there a performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us mm -hmm. to feel it's being misused and or misconstrued and you would like to put your own spin on it? Is there something that you have? Yeah. Um not necessarily performance tech related or uh, directly, but more just tech term in, in general. Um, so my my current pet piece, which there are many, um, <laughs> it's it's the term artificial intelligence. Okay. I I struggle with that um, so much. Um, and, and to a point, I think data or data analytics as well. I think it's just, the problem is these terms are really broad um, and there's no like shared, I think even like learning design, instructional design, right? I, I think there's, well, first of all, there's no like really a regulatory body to kind of say, this is a definitive definition. Um, performance tax the same way, you know, what's, what's performance tech? Like it could be, is it, is it my Fitbit, <laughs> you know? It's, it's, you know, so so I think, um, but I think it, it's close to my heart because AI has just been thrown around so much lately, the past three years in particular, um, by vendors, by, by by venture capitalists, by by people that wanted to you know get into the field, and 
and and it, it treat it as if it's like the, this the new thing. It's been around for sixty plus years, right? And 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 I think it's problematic because how do you even define intelligence? I think the origin of intelligence is problematic because you know is it IQ test? No, it's hugely false. Um, like you know we have multiple intelligence, but when it's when we look at AI, it's often viewed as very narrowly focused, right? Like it's a big field. So it, do you mean compute, um, computer visioning? Do you mean facial recognition? Do you mean robotic? Do you mean natural language processing? They are all parts of AI, um, but I think it's just so confusing. And I think it, it hurts um, organizations when, they, when they're trying to look at this technology and make decisions on like, should we purchase it? I a lot of times advise against it because it's it's not what you think it is, right? It's it's nowhere near um, what the promises are, um, and at the same time they are very expensive, and um, and you need a lot of data to make AI work. Um, but I think it's just very confusing, and and um, I really like um, there's a there's an article recently that got published by Forbes magazine um, by I think Kathleen. Bosch, and she actually proposed the term cognitive technology or cognitive tool. Um, I, I think it's maybe a, a better term for it. Maybe it leads to less misunderstanding. Um, so it's it's still not perfect, but I think um, as practitioners in our field, I think we need to help constantly refine this definition, but also like make people aware, like, hey, AI is not like all these things that you think they are. It, it could just be checkbots, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, so that's my, um, that, that's a big one for me. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. I think that we are very much challenged about language and our labels. And there is, like you said, there's no authority body to no. say definitively, this is the definition of this term or phrase. And, and hold people accountable to sticking with that. So that's something that, that's important for people coming into the field to understand that they've got to be very careful about how they interpret, how they internalize what's being said, because our language is so kind of sloppy. Oh, can I put something into um, for people that are, you know, wanted to get into this field? Um, I think it's problematic with job titles. <laughs> in general, um, and, and you know you know this as well as I do. Um, so e-learning, for example, a job posting about an e-learning specialist or e-learning, I don't know, um, coordinator or e-learning developer or designer, you can look at that title and, and there are 10 job descriptions that are all different, right? Um, some of them wanted you to do essentially three jobs at the same time. So I think um, be mindful if you're getting into this field to kind of read between the lines in these job descriptions and understand what they're asking for. And, and don't be afraid to push back and like ask questions and challenge that because again, there's no definitive definition. So each organization, each person, it's kind of defining it as it goes along. Yeah, that's so very true that the job titles are, you really have to, to probe to understand what are yeah. the responsibilities, what are the outputs and deliverables of the job. Um, yeah. The job title itself is just a convenience for human resources and, and setting exactly. expectation levels across the organization. It's not, you know, the same from organization to organization. Even for me, I struggle with like when people ask, oh, what's your job title, right? Um, what do you do? Um, mm -hmm. What do you say? You know, <laughs> I, I just, I just drop, I, I just keep it as simple as I can. Now I just say learning strategist. Um, and it, that's, it, that's probably a good <laughs> term here. I think that the, I, you know, I've been doing this for over 40 years and uh, I recently settled on a, a new title for myself about yeah. getting close to 10 years now, but it, but it has shifted over time. And so 
but it's just the nature of our language and, and things are constantly changing, sometimes because of marketing, sometimes because of new yeah. of technology and such. But uh, but it's something for the, the new people coming into the field to be aware of. Yeah, exactly. Um, so and don't be limited uh, to, to what the job title is as well. Yes, true. All right. So the, my next question is, I'd like to explore a little bit about... Um, some of the people or books or articles that are more recent in your, mm -hmm. uh, you've mentioned some of them that are recent, uh, are fairly new, at least they seem to be a little bit new to me, but but so for our audience, uh, there's a lot of good people out doing good things in, in the field here. Yeah. And so maybe this is a chance for you to do a little shout out uh, to individuals or maybe some of the yeah. that they've written that you might point our audience to. Well, uh, you for one, Guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I follow your blogs and your your Twitter polls and everything else. So um, I I find it so interesting now, um, like with Twitter and other blogs and other places to to get more timely information. Um, so uh, Laura Overton, um, I I like her research. I follow her. Uh, Danny Johnson, Red Threat Research, also. I follow her stuff. Uh, Emma Weber, really like her work. Um, Patty Shank, of course, um, amazing, amazing. Um, also keep reading um, outside our field as well. Um, Ruha Benjamin, she's a professor in Columbia uh, sociology. She, she writes about technology um, and race. So there's a book called Race After Technology. I think it's also like very relevant. Um, there's another book called Artificial Whiteness, um, how um, AI, it's, it's a tool for oppression. And so that's really interesting. Uh, the Atlas of AI is another newer book that just came out. Um, also very interesting. Um, what else? Um, Invisible. Invisible Women is about how um, the world is not designed for, for women. And it's really well researched and, and she collects all kinds of data on that. Um, so, so those are some of the books I've been reading and really um, impacted by them. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, it, Stella, thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview. My of course. whole question <laughs> is, uh, Assuming that my audience here is uh, includes a lot of people who are new to the field, just coming into yeah. the field, what advice or guidance would you give them? Um, you've spoken to a, a little bit about it already yeah. in this video, but uh, what 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 would you suggest that they pay particular attention to or be wary of as they begin their journey in the field? Well, we need another hour for that, but uh, go ahead. <laughs> Um, okay, so I think the biggest, biggest one to me, and, um, and this is advice given to me as well, um, I think we need more diversity um, in the field. And by diversity, I don't mean just like, like skin tone. I, I mean diversity in terms of age, in terms of academic discipline, life experiences, multiple perspectives, um, interest. I, I think that's what makes this field that that rich, right? That interesting. Um, so especially when it comes to like dealing, like I, I live in a technology space and people think, oh, wow, you have a PhD in computer science. Of course you would do that. But my point to, to you guys is we don't all have to be computer scientists or data scientists to like, to get in it. I think in, especially in a technology field, we, we need people that are from humanities, from social sciences, from the arts from other disciplines because it there's a lot of problems and challenges and we can't just look at it from one one perspective. Um, a lot of people that are in it that are trying to understand ethics are philosophers, right? Because they they have the language, they have the knowledge to bring that in to to understand that, um, and 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 also why we need policy people. Because again, we don't have policies for so many of these things. Um, so we need people that have that background. Um, so I think don't be afraid to come in to this field. Um, don't be afraid to be 
changing your career from seemingly unrelated discipline because they they all connected. Um, and um, I think the key is kind of stay curious and ask questions and 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 just keep digging and and keep updating your knowledge and but don't be afraid to bring in your own perspective and your own discipline focus to the field. So that's my that's my two cents. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. I, I think yeah. that that's that's good advice because you know we can do much better when we collaborate with others when we appreciate yeah. what others bring other perspectives and if we keep an open mind yeah understanding it because our, our the audiences that we serve the learners their management their customers there's all their stakeholders yeah it's a very diverse world and and it's and uh, the better we can understand and appreciate their needs and their situation, the better job that we might do in helping them meet their needs so that they can grow and prosper. And I think, um, I think sometimes we are fighting with our own uh, perception of imposter syndrome as well, thinking, oh, maybe, maybe I'm not good enough to come in to this discipline. It's, it's not true. Um, I, I can I can share that. Like I, I felt like, oh no, I'm not good enough because I didn't have this knowledge, but you just never have enough, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. Stella, thank you again so much for doing this. And I wish you well in the future. And I, I look forward to uh, continuing to follow you online. Thank you. It's been totally a pleasure to be talking with you guys. And, and thank you. I hope this is useful for everybody out there. Have a great day. Thanks.